Now it's official. Hello, everybody. Welcome to DevOps and Drinks. My name is Alex Dubavoy. I work at a company called Verity. We are the staffing agency, uh, formerly only in New York, now nationally, given that the apocalypse has happened. Um, but we do a lot of great work. We have a lot of good friends here that I see over here. But today's uh, meetup is not just to plug us, it's to help with the engineering community. Uh, and really, really excited. We've got two great presentations. Um, we're gonna kick it off with Ed Burnett. Uh, Ed is the VP of engineering at Vestwell and happens to be an awesome engineer himself, even though he might not admit it. He's very, very good at it. Um, he'll probably admit it, but Ed, all you, uh, welcome yep. to the meetup. If you guys have questions, throw them into the Q&A, and then we can make a decision on whether we answer them right away or towards the end of the presentation. Uh, just fire away, and uh, let's get to it. Uh, Ed Burnett at Festwell. Yep. Hi, y'all. Um, I do like questions. Um, when you say Q&A, you mean like the chat piece of Zoom, right? Yeah, yeah, chat, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, 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 like I said, I, I enjoy when people interrupt my talk with questions. I think it flows better. I really do. So feel free to shout some. Um, so hi all. The, uh, I made this presentation called SRE Tactics for Product Engineering Teams, partially because I've been living in product engineering world for uh, you know my stint at least here at Vestwell, and this is DevOps and Drinks. So I feel like this is a cool mash um so let me go a tiny bit about me um i've been doing full stack web development professionally since about 2006. last couple of years i've been at vestwell um as vpn before that i was at namely as one of the first engineers and kind of brought it up um and throughout all that i've been doing a lot of consulting advising for various early phase startups i very much enjoy early phase startups so I'm sure a lot of people know this, but site reliability engineering, it's a def, what, where it came from is from Google, um, SRE for short. They made a book in 2016, it's free. Um, the theme of this is basically going to be what I got from that book, how I've applied it to product engineering teams. Typically, and I, I, I'm, I can't speak exactly how Google runs it, but I know that they have like separate SRE teams and a lot of companies these days will basically use SRE as kind of a replacement for like DevOps, which is kind of a replacement for SysOps. Um, the way I kind of apply it is as a culture. I think SRE is a, basically a set, like it's a mindset um, and you can bring it to any team. And that's kind of what I've been doing. And that's what this talk is all about. So a prerequisite to all this is I call them squad based engineering teams. Um, a lot of people know about this from Spotify it became super popular. It's basically a cross functional team that owns a vertical slice of the product. Um, I, I say that it's chaos by design, because typically within a squad, you've got product folk, you've got engineering folk, QA folk, sometimes you have design folk, sometimes you have product folk or project folk, whatever. But the whole idea is that it's not like there's a manager of a team. It's kind of unique in you know, typical org charts. And this is by design because you want to treat this squad as a single entity, as a first class citizen, where they basically are empowered to make as many decisions as possible. Um, that includes like what project to work on to how they're gonna solve it. And then kind of the theme of all this is supporting that product. Um, and that's what you know, SRE is all about, how to make your service reliable. Um, so if you don't have squad based engineering teams, uh, you should try to get them, um, depending, you know, where you work and your org, but, uh, I, I consider it to be very much best practice. So just the topics we're going to talk through, um, there's kind of four pieces that I found super valuable. One is eliminating toil. Another is run book culture or playbook culture, managing incidents and postmortems. So let's just jump in. Chapter five of the SRE book is called Eliminating Toil. And I love this chapter. If, if there's any chapter you read from the SRE book, it's this one. Um, it should be at least. Uh, I've applied this to a lot of 
places. But so let's just define toil, at least what it means to me. So toil is something that's manual. So it's something that a person has to do to accomplish some tasks. It is automatable. So like in theory, you could make some clever script to do it. Um, there's no enduring value. So when the task is complete, you can expect more of those tasks to appear. And then it scales linearly. So that means if the business were to double in size, the tasks would double. Um, so just some best practices from the book and myself is that teams or squads that eliminate toil, that, that can eliminate toil, should deal with the toil. Um, so that means like you don't want a separate team that does support and a separate team that does like product development. Um, if you can't eliminate toil, you can make it more painful or <laughs> you can make it less painful. Uh, and that should be kind of a set out, you know, don't let enemy, don't let good be the enemy of perfect. Wait, no, I'm mixing everything up. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, so that means you can create tools that other people can use. You can make scripting so it takes less time and you can create playbooks, which we're getting into later. So just some examples. I thought about making this like an interactive quiz, but it's really just kind of examples. So let's say that 5% of zip codes that come in are improperly formatted and need to be manually corrected. That is toil because when you correct these zip codes, you are not really fixing the root cause. It could be automated. Um, it's going to scale linearly. If you 10X, you know, instead of like 10 zip codes per day, you're going to get 100 zip codes per day that you need to fix. Um, another example, external calls to an API occasionally fails and needs to be retried. Also toil. It's something that, you know, is going to scale linearly, manual, um, obviously could be automated, stuff like that. But then it's important to kind of define what toil is. It, you know, interrupt is a common theme to use when things like interrupt your workflow. Doesn't mean it's toil. So this is when, like, say, a daily script occasionally fails and need to be, needs to be retried. That's not really toil uh, because it doesn't scale with business. If you 10x that daily script, if it f occasionally fails, you're still going to just retry it. It's not like you have to retry it 10 more times. Um, every Monday, a team has to send a file to an external partner. It's not toil. Uh, so, you know, it's interrupt work, you're not doing long-term value, but it doesn't scale with business. Um, let's say there was a bug that QA found and the team needs to fix it and redeploy. That's also not toil because you're adding enduring value there. Um, you know, you're fixing the bug, you're preventing it from happening again. And let's say, you know, with that example with zip codes, let's say you create a one-off script to sweep your database and fix them. Um, you, know, you didn't really eliminate the root cause, but you did add enduring value. You're setting up some future automation and you're reducing the pain that it takes. So just a case study around this. Um, at some point in, uh, you know, it, it's, this has happened a few times, but specifically at Vestwell, we had two separate engineering teams. So team A was, was creating functionality. So they were, you know, building product, they were shipping it. And team B was supporting existing functionality. And basically this team B was kind of the support team. Um, it was supposed to reduce toil, but we were kind of in hyper growth. And so they were, got overwhelmed. They were unable to reduce the toil. They spent all their time on the actions and interrupt work and not actually adding value. So what we did is that we restructured the teams. We basically took this set of functionality, divided it in half and had you know, maybe restructured the people within the team so that team A owned one set of functionality and support, team B owned a different set of functionality and support. So kind of said, okay, here's your section, here's your section, both of you have to deal with the toil. And what this did, this, this is kind of a, you know, psychology trick of like, give the teams the pain. Um, I probably could have made a bullet point around here, but pain is good often when like reducing toil, because if a team is dealing with this, they're going to want to get rid of it. So you know, the theme, the main takeaway with this is that a team that owns a product should be a, they really should also own the manual support of that product. It's really bad practice to have like separate feature teams and separate support teams. So that's my spiel on toil.
I don't know, I don't see any questions with chat, but if people want to jump in before I continue, feel free. Could toil is is toil also something that like basically and again it's coming from somebody non-technical so forgive me if it sounds off here but something that is just straight up manual that can just be automated that simple like ultra simplified right yeah yeah i i mean the book has a few more like uh traits um you know my traits that i use in identifying toil is that it is manual it's automatable. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, when it, when it's automatable, it doesn't mean that it's simple. You know, it could be that like, Hey, we need to build this whole piece of functionality in order to get rid of it. Um, but you know, the, the key parts of this I'd say are, you know, the in no enduring value, like, you know, fixing zip codes one at a time. Like when you're done with that, you didn't do anything really. You just fix some data in the system and then you can expect more to come, especially if you're growing, you're going to just see that increase. That's great. That's, that's, that's I don't know if you. Yeah. Cool. I asked something about what you said earlier about teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the monolithic methods inside engineering teams creating product is, you know, they're just engineers. We don't, you know, insert a product person in there. We don't insert, you know, a functional mm -hmm. a business person in there. We don't insert the QA in there. QA is 100% you know, uh, compartmentalized outside. Are you saying you've been working in teams where all of these people are all in one sort of, you know, Slack channel, you know, yammering at each other all day? That's, that's the North Star. You know, it doesn't always work that way, depending on like, you know, the company that you are part of and like what you're building. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in a sense, like the way... I, you know, these teams are set up. It's, it's almost like a little family. Like they have their own culture. They have their own process. I, I, we, the theory is they really own everything. You know, they own how they're, uh, the, what tech they're using. They're, in theory, they choose which problems to solve. They choose how they're going to solve it. Um, you know, in practice to do it today at Vestwell, you know, we have some teams doing Kanban, some doing uh, sprints. Some are uh, more front end focus. Some are purely back end with no uh, front end at all. And, you know, that basically empower them to own this slice of the product. And so for me, you know, I, we have like, you know, 10 squads or something. When there's an issue or a request, I route it to that squad. And then I put expectations of the squad that they as a team has to fix it. Right. And I mean, I understand your intuition perfectly. The way things work, though, and Alex knows I'm embedded in a number of, number of emerging software firms, um, is that product is completely separate. And they kind of go over there and think for, you know, three weeks and come up with an idea. And then engineering picks up the ball. Your version is, you know, product should be embedded inside engineering from day one. Well, it's not my model, it's Spotify's model, but yeah, it's, um, you know, that's, that is essentially it. Uh, that, I mean, to be clear though, when you say a separate team, like they are separate departments, like we have a CPO, a chief product officer, we have a CTO and each of them has their orgs. But the whole idea of these squads is that we basically shuffle them together. So like a squad itself doesn't have a manager. That's kind of another key point here. I could really do a whole talk about this. I love talking about this. I, I don't want to derail too, too much, but um, you know, th that's, that's the theory or what I call like the North star of all this. So essentially what you're saying is, uh, you know, the, the, the motto of a self-managing team, uh, it's a team of people that are responsible for an activity or a set of activities, but not necessarily a reporting structure. And I think that's yes. where I think folks might get confused. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, non-squad based teams are like, hey, here's a manager and the people that report to them, that's a team, right? There's a clear delineation in terms of, um, you know, uh, authority. 
but uh the whole idea of a squad is that it is like you know you bring people together from different orgs and basically force them to like live as a little family there's a ton of different like best practices here i, I like i said I, I could make a whole talk about this um but yeah i mean like you know the whole idea is that they they own everything about a piece of the product you know like a really good example is like a login portal they uh they know the problems with the login portal they choose which problems to solve they choose how to solve it choosing the tech in the process and then they deploy it so if there's any issue down the line with the login portal we route it to the squad and we say hey squad this is your responsibility fix this and yes, you mentioned like self-organizing. That is a key part of this. Cool. Um, I'll just move on. Uh, so here's a non-chapter advice. This is about playbook culture. So there's not really a chapter in the SRE book about this, but it references these playbooks or runbooks uh, all the time. And this is basically a document that has a clear set of steps and actions to take when an event occurs. And basically, again, down to squads, squads should own their set of playbooks. They should basically, you know, in act of supporting their piece of the product, create these playbooks that can be used. Um, often you need logging and alerting. I'll get into that in like the case study. Uh, Links are also important alerts. So this is basically what happened earlier in Vestwell. Um, there was this daily script that ran. It would cause errors occasionally. Engineering team would have to step in and handle manually. This, in order to fix this, basically the engineering team had to manually search in the database for this data, execute these tasks. It wasn't easily automatable. We knew it could be automated, but you know, we couldn't prioritize it. It wasn't realistic to totally eliminate or, uh, you know, totally fix this completely. So what we did is that we built automation to alert to um, our internal Slack room when this issue occurred. And basically this alert had some base level information like, hey, here's some information and here's a link to a playbook. And then we kind of outsource this. We made it less painful for the engineering team by asking a non-tech team to kind of gather information when this occurred. And then they would create a ticket to engineering um, so that when the engineering team had this info, we could just quickly handle it. So this is an example of, again, with toil, like if we, you can't eliminate it completely, make it less painful or maybe less expensive because it's, you know, a general theme here is engineering, time is more expensive than non-engineering time. So if you can reduce the amount of time the engineering spends, it's okay. Um, often, you know, don't make perfect the enemy of good. Uh, so that's playbook, run book culture. Any thoughts before I move on? Cool. Um, Managing incidents, chapter 14. This is uh, a great chapter. Um, the, specifically in the book, they have a really, really great case study in here. I recommend reading it. So a really important thing to do is define your process ahead of time because basically an unmanaged incident, I think everyone's dealt with it. It's just a huge, horrible situation. When something fails, you don't know who's working on it. You don't know who's fixing it. So define this process. And this is basically what the book recommends is first you need to define when an incident occurs. And this is basically like an unplanned disruption. If this is subjective. You kind of want to take like the Toyota model and allow anyone to pull the cord. So that means if someone thinks that it's an incident, they should say, hey, I think this is an incident. We need to do this. We need to roll out the incident response. So the book recommends basically dividing roles. So you want an incident commander. So this is like the lead. Is, they are immediately in charge of creating an ad hoc team. 
So they can pull people from separate squads. They can say like, hey, I want this person. Hey, I want this person. And they essentially choose the actions to be taking place. Operational work, often you want someone to like make changes in the system, maybe not make changes, but you know, maybe do discovery, but these are like lackeys, if you will. Um, another important step is external communication. When there is an incident, it's kind of a public thing. And you want to set expectations to external st stakeholders. You want to say like, hey, we got this. This is what you can expect. Um, you know, this is when we estimate things will be ready, stuff like that. And then an internal documenter. Uh, this is basically someone that keeps the timelines of actions. This is super important to the postmortem. And, uh, you know, basically they're not in charge of making decisions. They're not in charge of making changes or doing anything. They're only in charge of following along and recording what's happened. Uh, and just a note, multiple roles can be shared by a single individual, small team. You might have one person doing everything. You might have one person making decisions and doing work and another person doing all documentation and communication, stuff like that. These are just roles. But the goal of an incident is to bring the service and or the product back to a stable state. You want to get out of the incident state as soon as you can. A longer term goal is you prepare for the postmortem, which is uh, the next piece of this. So here's an incident response. This is a uh, real one. Um, it follows into the postmortem, but basically out of crystal air, there was an unknown error, basically, essentially a bunch of services broke at once. The service team started complaining, internal alerts started going off. We knew something was bad. So we created an incident room. So the very first thing you do is kind of like create the team, you make the Slack room, you invite people into other squads, you create a couple documents. One is like internal. So like, this is what we are going to use for the source of truth. Another is an external document saying like, hey, we got this, we're on it. Often that's all they need. And there was a big scramble because everything was kind of going off at once. The team scrambled to find the root cause. Ultimately, it was within one of our databases, a primary key had kind of overflowed. It was using an integer um, data type and we reached the max and things started breaking all over the place. And Basically, there was a few ways you can go from here. Um, this is kind of key in an incident. You want to propose, you want to go after one solution at once. You know, you don't want one person to like start migrating data, another person to change the data type, another person to start, you know, like changing IDs or like changing the uh, internal database pieces all at once. You, you choose a solution, you go after it. The system was resolved and brought back to normal, and then the postmortem kicked off. So this flows naturally from chapter 14 to 15 in the book, which is postmortems. And just a note, if you're going to read two chapters in the book, read this as your second chapter. First is Eliminating Toil. This is the second most important chapter in the book. So there's a term here, blameless postmortem. I, I, don't really know where it came from, but this is super, super important. Um, you want to emphasize this every single postmortem multiple times, especially when you have people kind of traumatized by bad orgs that want to like blame people, but don't blame people, blame the system. If, if something happened and, you know, even if someone forgot to hit a button or didn't follow a playbook correctly, it's not their fault. It's the system's fault that it allows for this error to occur. So blame the system, not the people. Um, when to hold a postmortem, you can kick it off from a major incident, like the whole site going down, or you could hold a postmortem if a single bug was caught in production. These are important um, because if, if a bug was caught in production, that means something happened in the system that allowed this bug to get loose, you know? So... This is what I think is really, really important as well. You want to divide, so this is a meeting, right? You've got a meeting, you've got a group of people and you divide it into phases. So you first document what the summary is, what happened, um, you know, 
how, who, what was affected by this. You spend some time actually writing a timeline of events. Do not glaze over this. This is super important. And it's, you want to make sure that this is correct, that everyone agrees to it, that, hey, on this occasion, this happened, this action took place, this system failed, et cetera, et cetera. Discuss contributing factors. Some people recommend the five whys. Honestly, I think it's a little overblown or, um, you know, you don't have to do the five whys, but this is kind of what people use five whys for. But this is when you're discussing like, essentially like what caused this. Um, there's a lot of different lenses you could look at it. Um, and then kind of the most important piece is discuss action items because the ultimate goal of a postmortem is to prevent this from ever happening again. Let's say you have an incident where there's an overflowing index, you never want that happening again. Let's say there's a bug released in production, um, you know, on the login portal, you never want that bug to be released again. So you want to create and prioritize these action items. Just some tips because uh, these aren't specifically in the book, but it's kind of what I've learned from conducting a bunch of these. The first is you want to leave enough time. Um, don't hold postmortems that are like half an hour and like you haven't rushed through. Take your time, feel like allow some exploration. It may take over an hour, may take multiple postmortem follow ups. You know, you may not get everything the first try. So make sure that you're leaving enough time here. You want to invite everyone that you that wants to be there. Um, everyone is equal there. Uh, invite other leaders of the org, invite non-tech people, invite other squads that even weren't affected by it because it's important to spread the culture of this and spread the knowledge. There's no reason why blameless postmortems have to be a tech only exercise. Um, you want to create a public document. There's an artifact at the end of a postmortem, which is a, you know, essentially exactly what I listed before. You've got a summary, a timeline, contributing factors, and action items. Those are the key pieces. Uh, create that as a document and create a collection of these postmortems. Um, spreading knowledge is as important as action items. Let's say, you know, we know that there's a larger problem at hand and there are no action items or like the action items listed are like, hey, rebuild this entire service, but you know you're not going to get there. That's okay. Because, you know, just awareness of gaps is still important. Remember, spread the knowledge. And last tip, if you are a new employee, or if you know there are new employees, um, hold postmortems, because it allows you to kind of like play the protagonist. You, you can ask why, you can like dig into these pieces of the product and learn the system. Uh, sometimes the best way to learn how an org works or how, uh, you know, how a product works or infrastructure works is to hold the postmortem on a really trivial event. You get to learn about alerting, you get to learn about logging, you get to learn about monitoring, you get to learn about existing culture, um, individuals, different teams and responsibilities, different services. So super useful tool if you are joining a new company. So here's a case study, just kind of following up from the overflow index issue. Um, once it was resolved, uh, we basically held the postmortem. Um, I guess I could have said another tip, by the way, hold the postmortem as soon as you can, like day of, if possible, um, or the same week, ideally, do not hold the postmortem on something that was a long time ago, because you're going to lose a lot of, you know, front brain knowledge. So the timeline, the timeline of events around the indexes is super simplified, but there was high volume over the past year. So, you know, you can look at in the past, so like, okay, we got a lot of volume. Um, everything was kind of flowing into this table. And then all of a sudden errors flowed in and we were searching around for the root cause. We found it and we ultimately updated the table um, index to a larger data type. So instead of like integer, we use like a big int or something. Contributing factors. Why did this happen? Well, we had a smaller data type for primary key index. Yes, that was a contributing factor. Also, there was a lack of alerting when the index approached max. So we didn't know that this was going to happen um, beforehand. We, all, we basically had to wait for it to happen. And then also there was chaos from multiple alerts caused a slow response time. We didn't know what was broken. We didn't know why it was breaking. 
basically had to kind of discover that um, by process of elimination. So what were the action items from this? We decided that for all of these indices, um, we wanted to look at all of our data types. We wanted to sweep through all of our databases or all of our tables and um, upgrade you know, the, the indexes. We didn't wanna make sure that this was gonna happen again. We added some alerting um, for errors around the specific service. So if this service were to fail, uh, instead of, you know, basically we realized there was a gap in this alerting. So we created a better alerting around this service because it was a core service a lot of other services relied on. And then we kind of took a longer term approach. Okay, this is a culture change. We need to have better process when we create better uh, new services and database tables. We need to upgrade our entire culture of creating services and, you know, maybe emphasize some documented standardization, you know, not exactly a short-term action item, but something that an org is important to do. So main takeaway, the whole point of a postmortem is define, create, and prioritize action items. So this is kind of, again, my uh, thoughts and learnings after kind of reading this book and other SRE stuff, bringing it to product engineering teams and working within those product engineering teams. It's a culture, it's not a team. Um, it's just a natural progression from agile. Uh, I, like I said, I could talk about this stuff all day, but um, you know, agile leads into SRE. The themes of this, and we kind of got into this a little bit with the squad discussion, but ownership, empowerment, transparency. These are kind of root cause, like, or not root cause, but like fundamental pieces of culture that good engineering teams should have. Lastly, read the book. It's a really great book. It's free. Um, there's another book. I didn't read that one yet or all of it, but at least read those chapters. Um, last plug, Veswell is hiring. So uh, if you're interested, hit me up or check out a careers page. Um, and Ed is a really good guy to work for. Sorry, what's that? I said you're a good guy to work for. Um, <laughs> I, just to just to plug real quick, I like what you said about blaming the process, not the person. And, an engineer knows if they made a mistake. And they don't necessarily need to be called out on it. Like if you if you want to really get get to it, look at the big picture. Look at those processes, and then it can become a learning experience, um, much more than just a bash session. Because all that's going to lead to is attrition at the end of the day, and people playing defense all day. Yeah, the other thing it leads to is a uh, incorrect timeline. Um, you know, if, yeah. if you know that someone hit the wrong button. Right, and they know that they're going to be blamed if they hit that button incorrectly. Then they might not share that they hit the button incorrectly, and you know, all of a sudden you're you've got the wrong set of uh, contributing factors. You know, absolutely, absolutely. The, the the transparency has to be there, and if people know they're not going to be blamed, and just more, you know, hey, let's all learn together. You're going to get a lot more credited information. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the goal is to prevent it from happening. Again. You know, that's, that's the, that's the thing here. Awesome. Any, anybody have any other questions for Ed before uh, we kick it off with Brandy? Yeah. I have uh, a question about the, the action items. I really like the, the approach of sort of taking the error that you found and then reviewing the whole system and making sure that um, it's fixed basically everywhere. But uh, my question was, Usually that is then done by the by the dev team, right? By the engineers and not so much by the SRE or by the DevOps guys. How do you like how do you how do you reconcile the impact on the dev team? You know, like let's say we found this in one place, it has to be fixed in 10 other places, but there are all these priorities. Um, mm -hmm. what's more important is fixing it so that this will not happen again, you know, potentially, or is it, you know putting that a little bit on the back burner and, and focusing on the current priorities. You know, it, I get to totally do a cop out and say, it depends, you know, uh, yeah. like it, there, there's, this gets into like what best practice around squads have. I'd say one best practice is to 
always have a certain amount of time dedicated to, you know, interrupt work or uh, tech improvements, right? If, if your team is focused 100% on product delivery, then you've got no slack to actually address this stuff. So, you know, th this is a buy-in with the product team ahead of time or like, you know, the sales team, whoever's like building your like <laughs> uh, high priority builds, right? But I, I'd say that that is a major factor here. Um, and again, it kind of comes down to why these squads are important because if the team itself has to deal with this incident, right, then it's self-evident. It's like, hey, like this is a very clear action item that we need to prioritize because it may happen again at any time. And then it's kind of like, yeah, you're absolutely correct. If it is a separate team saying like, hey, we would like to prioritize this and the other team has no knowledge about like the incident or no knowledge of, uh, you know, the potential action items, they weren't involved in the incident, they weren't involved in the postmortem, they're more likely to be like, nope, uh, you know, we're just going to take that risk. Okay, thank you. Quick follow up. How much time do you have reserved for that type of work at West at uh, at Bestwell? Just curious. Um, you know, t it it depends on the team. Uh, often teams are going to have higher interrupt than others, but we try to leave uh, ten percent. So you know, if if they're doing uh, two week sprints, like one day of that sprint. Um, is typically kind of reserved for that. It really is hard, you know, it, it, I've never found a perfect model here um, because it depends on the team, it depends on the system, it depends on the priorities. It depends on, uh, you know, the amount of postmortems. You know, I, I mentioned before that you can have a postmortem if there's a single bug or like a site-wide incident. Often you're gonna have if you have a lot of incidents, site-wide incidents, you're going to be only holding postmortems on those site-wide incidents, you know, and uh, there's no room to hold postmortems on like the small stuff. Um, sorry if those answers are kind of cop-outs. <laughs> no, very helpful. Thanks very much. Sure. Anybody Thank else? Cool. Well, thank you all. Ed, thank you so much. Um, it's always great to have you presenting. Um, Good stuff. Randy, there. Thanks. you are up next. Um, I can introduce you based on your bio, but I'm pretty sure you can do a better job yourself. So I'm just going to go ahead and be quiet. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. I think Ben was going to say something just to kick off this session before oh, sure. I get started. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, everyone. So this is Ben Plowman from BMC Software, um, part of the uh, sales team here. But Brandy is going to go into a demonstration of how we can help orchestrate data pipelines. Um, a lot of what we heard, um, you know, just a few moments ago from Ed, um, actually ties really well into our message and um, what we're doing and helping our customers with. So Brandy, the floor is yours. Um, go ahead and kick us off. Thanks, thanks. And um, just to throw that in, throw this in there as well, um, during the next 20 minutes that I have, feel free to interrupt me and ask any questions. Um, I'll also be kind of watching the chat window. If you're more comfortable putting your questions in the chat, I'll also answer those kind of while I'm going through the, the demonstration. Um, but again, my name is Brandy Coleman. I'm a senior solution engineer with BMC Software. Um, the product that I'm going to be introducing and demoing today is our Helix Control M product, which is a SaaS uh, workflow orchestration and, and automation platform. Um, so first, I kind of wanted to make sure that you all can see my screen. We can. You can. Got okay, it. perfect. You can see the diagram. Thanks. Um, so first, I just wanted to talk about the use case that I'm going to cover today. As, as Ben mentioned, uh, the use case is a data pipeline um, use case centered on um, AWS services. Um, so this use case covers 
um, leveraging predictive maintenance to analyze sensor data on vehicles and to be able to proactively alert drivers to equipment failures that are coming in based on analyzing that data from those sensors um, and then sending notifications to those drivers that they would need to um, address those equipment issues before they actually turn into failures and, and have downtime and not being able to use their vehicles. Um, so this is a, a very specific kind of use case, but the goal of this use case is to show how with different data pipelines, it doesn't type of data you're, you're ingesting into your environment or what underlying services or platforms that you're using. Control M or Helix Control M is a workflow orchestration um, and automation platform that's going to give you that visibility from start to finish of your data pipeline to tie all of those pieces together to eliminate toil, um, like, like Ed had mentioned, to automate this process to give you the visibility into monitoring um, the intermediate steps in this process to be able to remediate issues. So if a job fails or a step fails in this pipeline, to be able to receive alerts automatically and remediate those alerts automatically, as well as to be able to maintain and keep in line with any service level agreements or SLAs that are attached to these pipelines as well. So maybe every day this pipeline needs to um, send these alerts to drivers by 5 p.m. or within five minutes of this pipeline being triggered, having control in, monitor the pipeline and be able to proactively um, send you alerts if something's going wrong and you're gonna miss those SLAs as well. So just wanted to show this diagram to show the use case as a whole, um, in terms of the services that Control M is going to be integrating with in this pipeline, the data is going to be ingested in the form of, of raw IoT sensor data on these um, for these vehicles. It's going to be transferred into an S3 bucket. So we're going to show how Control M integrates with Amazon S3, watching the S3 buckets and transferring files from those S3 buckets automatically into an Amazon EMR cluster. Um, Control M is also going to integrate with Hadoop within the EMR cluster and trigger some Spark uh, processes or linear regression that's going to model that data that's transferred into that cluster. Um, and then towards the end of the pipeline, be able to send alerts via Amazon SNS to those drivers via a text message. Um, so this is just a diagram of the use case. And then I'm going to pause there to see if there are any questions about high level and then jump into the live demo showing the Helix Control M um, product itself. Any questions? OK. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is Michael. I have one question. Sure. So if you go back, and maybe I'm getting overly pedantic here, but does the, in this, are you taking the Kinesis data firehose and pushing that directly to EMR, as well as processing it in EMR from S3, or is there just an extra arrow there? So it's, it's just an extra arrow. This is a, a, a intermediate process, um, and we would be kind of plugging into the S3 bucket and watching the files um, in the S3 bucket. So we're gotcha. more so triggering based on file appearing in S3 and uh, Kinesis is kind of ingesting that, that data and pushing it to S3 as the beginning. That's what I thought. Okay, cool, thanks. No problem. Perfect. So um, with Helix Control M, um, just to talk about the interfaces or, or access methods and how this kind of ties into to DevOps, um, Helix Control M has two main interfaces. The, the web interface, which you see here on the left, where you're able to create your workflows um, in in uh, the planning domain here, I'm able to add different job types, create dependencies, create the scheduling components, actions that I'll kind of go over in a second, um, as well as monitor or be able to view those, those workflows or those processes as they're actively running. So I'm able to see these processes being triggered, able to see failures, remediate those failures, rerun, hold, all of that right within the monitoring domain. And there are some other interfaces like Manage File Transfer, um, which is going to be our solution for transferring files um, from one destination to another, as well as watching for files to appear and triggering some downstream processes based on that file arrival. And the Manage File Transfer tab allows you to do reverse lookups. So I know yesterday I had a specific TXT file that was supposed to be transferred. And I just want to see which job was associated with that file transfer, did it in successfully, what were the logs associated to that file transfer. You can gather all of that information very quickly within the Manage File Transfer tab. 
And then lastly, configuration is going to be that more administrative um, interface where I'm creating the, the connections or the agents that are actually going to be running this work. I'm defining agents, I'm installing the plugins that I'll go over in a second that are going to be um, assigned on those agents. All of that's gonna be done within the configuration domain. So the second interface that we have um, in parallel to the web interface is our developer centric interface. So a lot of times, depending on the type of persona, maybe interacting with the GUI is not a favorable way of, of ingesting or leveraging a tool. A lot of developers are using IDEs like Visual Studio Code, which you see here on the right, or Eclipse or IntelliJ, and they're creating their application code or, or fixing and testing their application code in an interface like this. So we wanted to expose the creation of these workflows um, to be able to leverage that in an IDE as well. So all of the workflows that I'm gonna show, all of the, the steps, the connections, all of the details that I'm gonna define are also able to be defined in, in code in JSON format or XML or we have a Python client as well that allows you to create these workflows um, and deploy them in Python as well. Um, in addition to creating the workflows in, in a IDE, we also have a REST API endpoint into ControlM. So as I'm running these workflows and, and validating them and rerunning steps within the pipeline, you can do all of that via our REST API or our command line interface utility as well. So depending on the persona, there might not be a need to actually open up the GUI. You can do everything as code um, in a more of a developer-centric um, way as well. So enabling the creation of these workflows as code is a part of that kind of shift left where a developer does not have to make a request, send an email to a control M administrator or another team that's kind of managing the creation of these workflows. The developer can create their own workflow that's going to tie into the application code that's leveraging it right within the same IDE that they're using and then move the workflow, the control M workflow and the workflow or their application code through their CI CD or, or DevOps process and build and release both components together at the same time. So you're able to test and validate your application code as well as your control and workflows together um, early and often throughout your kind of CI CD pipeline as well. So just wanted to show an example of, of what a pipeline could look like leveraging the CTM utility to kind of build and validate your control M workflows. I don't have steps to kind of build and validate application code married in here. This is just the control M component, but just wanted to show an example of, of how the control M command line utility could be embedded in something like a, a Jenkins file or maybe a, a YAML file for, for GitLab uh, CI to be able to build and release your control and workflow in, in your environment. So this is just an example here of those embedded steps within some of the stages within a, a Jenkins file where I could be building and testing and validating this code right alongside my application code. So any questions while I have both of these interfaces kind of up in, in parallel, creating your workflow, graphically in the web interface, or maybe developing and creating your workflow as code in this JSON uh, format here. Looks like we're good. Perfect. So I'll just expand the, the web interface to, to show a, a larger picture of what we're doing here in the, in the planning domain. So again, this workflow that I have open is that specific use case that we talked about in the, in the previous slide. In the, in the planning domain within ControlM, we have what we call control modules, which are out of the box plugins where you can drag and drop these different connectors to different applications, create dependencies between them and create a workflow. In our case, a, a orchestration component for a data pipeline to have all of these steps be dependent on each other. Maybe we're adding a scheduling component to this workflow to have control and kick this off and monitor it to completion. So these are just a list of some of the different options that we have here. We have a database plugin, which allows you to do embedded queries or SQL scripts on any type of database. Our file watcher component, 
Hadoop, which allows you to integrate with a Hadoop cluster and run a variety of different Hadoop execution types. Spark is what we'll show for this specific use case, um, AWS. Azure, our SLA management component. And then another aspect that we have for these plugins are application integrator job types. So we have a group of control modules that come out of the box, but a lot of times there's technologies that are being created and added daily. And we have the application integrator tool that allows you to create custom plugins to applications that don't exist in this uh, grouping. And you can integrate via command line interface, REST API or web service to create some of these plugins like you see down here, Azure Data Factory, SnapLogic, Power BI, and all of these job types, whether they are created by uh, BMC personnel or other customers, we do have a hub, which is a, a kind of open source environment where customers and BMC personnel have posted these job types um, that you could leverage and add to your environment as well. Another thing to mention in this in this planning domain, we have here some of these different job types and these job types have dependencies so very quickly you can just drag and drop a connector between two job types that says the IOT jar setup job type cannot run until it's predecessor, which is this create cluster job type finishes uh, successfully so that's kind of the out of the box um, action that's created with this dependency. Another thing that we can kind of use control M to do is create actions based on how your job is functioning. So out of the box with control M, if a job fails, an alert is going to be generated within control M out of the box. Um, but maybe you want your alert to be triggered and automatically send a message to a Slack channel uh, for the example that, that Ed had mentioned earlier. You can set up an action that may be based on job failure or if a specific job hasn't been um, ordered or triggered by 3 p.m., automatically generate an alert and send a message to a Slack channel to notify the correct people that there's something that they need to remediate. You can have control them automatically do those type of alerts, as well as maybe in addition to creating the alert for that Slack channel, also order another workflow that's going to remediate that issue automatically as well. So this is all about contr leveraging control them or Helix control them to be able to eliminate, eliminate toil, eliminate that manual effort and allow control them to orchestrate um, your pipeline start to finish and also monitor it to completion, handling alerts, handling output, the way that your team um, sees, sees that control them could be leveraged that way to do so. So in terms of ordering these workflows, a lot of times um, there are kind of three main ways that uh, organizations tend to have these workflows be triggered. You might want to manually trigger it. So I don't want this workflow to run every day. I just want it to workflow. I want it to run when, when my specific team needs it run. So I want to manually order that workflow in. Or maybe I want this workflow, this data pipeline to be triggered on a schedule. So I want every day at 3 a.m. this work, this pipeline to be triggered. Or maybe I want it to be triggered cyclically. So every five minutes it's triggered. Control M has the ability to be very calendar and schedule based as well as maybe event driven. So maybe after a specific file appears on an S3 bucket, then I want my workflow to, to be triggered based on that event. Um, so Control M has the ability to be schedule based or manually um, ordered, as well as event driven, maybe after a file appears, for example, um, have this pipeline automatically be kicked off. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the, the monitoring domain and talk about kind of what this workflow looks like as it's actively running um, in, the, in the monitoring environment. And as I switch screens here, I will pause one more time to see if there are any questions so far. Okay, perfect. So in the monitoring domain um, for, for Helix Control M, you have the ability to create a viewpoint, um, which basically organizes the monitoring domain to show you only the, the workflows that are specific to you um, or your team. So I have this workflow, this viewpoint um, right here that's going to show me that workflow that I just, just ordered. So right off the bat with Helix Control M, we have the color coding that kind of shows you just at a high level, what's going on with your jobs? Has it ended okay? Is it green? Is it waiting for user confirmation, which gives you this color? Is it currently executing? So this folder is still in an executing state. 
which is that orange color. Um, if it's in a wait condition, if the job is waiting for, for something to be, be done, it's gonna be gray. And then obviously red would be um, ending in a, in a failure. So within Control M, as your workflow is triggering, this workflow is touching a, a variety of different um, AWS services. We're interfacing with um, EMR in this, in this first job. We're doing some file transfers with S3 in the second job. And a lot of times you don't wanna have to open up the AWS console and go to the EMR service and see is your EMR cluster created or see the status of that. Control M allows you to, from one single point of control or one single interface, be able to view what's happening under the covers with these, with these jobs. So in the output over here, I'm able to quickly see what's happening in AWS when I'm creating this EMR cluster. I'm able to see the command. I'm able to see the ID of the cluster when the cluster was started. I'm able to get the IP address of the cluster. All of this information is all within Control-M and it's stored in the output as well as it's stored historically within Control-M as well. Um, so you're able to get all of this information here graphically, but you're also able to use the API, whether it be the command line interface utility, or the REST API to also get this information. Maybe you have a script or a part of your pipeline. You don't want to go to the next step in your pipeline until a specific output statement is received. You can gather all of this information via API calls as well. Um, so with Control-M and, and this specific example right here, we're creating an EMR cluster in AWS. So an EMR cluster is gonna be your, your one this one master node that's being created and within that master node we're also dynamically adding a control m agent to the bootstrap process of that that master node so these steps in this pipeline are going to be actually executed on a specific host or a host group so this is that kind of where where are you triggering the, these steps and with control m the where is platform agnostic it can be in an EMR, a node in AWS. It can be in a virtual machine in, in Azure. It can be on-prem on a Linux or, or Windows host. The where in terms of control M is platform agnostic. It can also be in, in a container. So as con the containerized architecture is being um, more prevalent in, in organizations and you're wanting to dynamically scale up Kubernetes clusters and adding pods to that cluster, control M agents can also be embedded in the Docker images that are supplied to have control M agents being created there as well. So control M agents are, are platform agnostic and control M has the ability to uh, load balance across groups of agents with, a, with what we see here as, as a host group. So just wanted to point that out there, there as well. And then while we're kind of moving down this pipeline, so the first job here, uh, created that EMR cluster. And then once that cluster was up and running, this job ended in a, in a success state. And then we're moving down the pipeline where the first thing we're doing here is a file transfer. So we're transferring a file from an S3 bucket um, onto my, my master node on my EMR cluster. So we're able to get real-time status of those file transfers. We're able to get an incremental output of what's happening in that file transfer. Maybe the file transfer ended at 50%. You're able to restart from points of failure with, with file transfer as well. And you'll be able to quickly see what's happening here um, if your file transfer failed for a specific reason. One thing that, that the monitoring domain allows for you to do as well is to rerun a job. So maybe my process failed on, on step 50 and I don't want to go restart the entire process. You can rerun a specific job in your pipeline right from within the monitoring domain or an API. You could also build in an action to automatically restart if your job fails, if you don't wanna to have to have that manual um, interaction to restart it here as well. Kind of moving down this pipeline, just wanting to show the Hadoop job type that we have out of the box here. So this job type is going to again, um, connect to my Hadoop on my EMR node, and it's going to execute a Spark job that's going to do some linear regression on the data that I'm loading into my, my, my cluster. Um, here we have a connection profile, and for Control-M, the connection profile stores all of the access 
the credentials for this uh, this node. So usernames, passwords, keys, all of that is stored in a connection profile and not exposed kind of to the end user um, for a level of, of security there. And then again, just kind of looking at the the output here, um, it's a bit of it's a bit of a, of the outputs is going to take a little bit to load, but this is going to give you again that Spark output, what you would see if you actually SSH'd into the node and looked at the, the Spark log, all of this information is right here in Control M. So you get that one stop shop view um, of everything right from one single point of, of control. And so with the monitoring domain, so this is kind of that idea of being able to manage and view and orchestrate your entire data pipeline. This is a small example, but we have customers that have workflows with hundreds of thousands of jobs from one single, single point of control and also touching a variety of different platforms. This is AWS specific, but again, controlling this platform agnostic where you might have services on different platforms or more services than what we're talking about here. And Control is gonna be used to integrate and orchestrate all of those platforms from one single um, point of, of control. And also just to kind of show or bring this back up on the right as well, Control M also has two main interfaces for for interacting and ingesting control and whether it be programmatically on the right or graphically um, on, on the left. So with that, um, I wanted to pause or, or conclude um, and see if there were any questions from the group. I think we're in good shape. Um... For Control M, it works equally as good for tools like EKS or GKE or native Kubernetes as well, or absolutely. is there more of a preference? Nope, absolutely. Under the covers to Control M, it's all interfacing with you know the the CLI or the API for that tool. So um, if we're interfacing directly with Kubernetes, that's kind of the look and feel is the same across those those uh, platforms. And if you're interfacing directly with that platform's API. To control them is just another application. Um, so it would be just another job here. You tell it what to do and when to do it, and control them is going to orchestrate that. I have a quick question. I came in a bit later and I see there's a Jenkins file here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not familiar. This is my first time seeing control M. So I'm just trying to understand how this might interface with Jenkins. Right, it's a good question. Um, so, so with Control M, I'm kind of showing the the two ways of creating a workflow in Control M, whether it be um, graphically, like you see here, or and I opened up my Jenkins file on the right, or via code. So, a lot of times, um, developers have their application code and they have a build and release pipeline, maybe in Jenkins already, and you want to marry the workflow or the Control M the control M aspect, the control M workflow with that application code. So you might have a Jenkins file that has your build and release steps for your application code. I'm showing here how you can insert the control M build and release steps in that Jenkins file to do both at the same time. So you're testing and validating your application code at the same time as you're testing and validating your, your control M workflow that that application code might be leveraging. Okay, so it looks like they you, know, you can use them in concert. They kind of complement each other, or Absolutely. Can they use BMC Absolutely. to replace Jenkins. So, um, if you already have a Jenkins pipeline kind of built out, where we don't want to replace what you're currently doing, we kind of just want to live and breathe within that technology and use Control M to give you that end-to-end -end view of everything. Um, a lot of the things that Jenkins does, Control M could also do as as well. Um, but the the use case that I'm showing here is having Control M live with. Jenkins um, and use both together at this at the same time. Right. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. Good question. Thanks. Excellent. Anybody have uh, any other questions at all? All right, everybody. Um, I guess we're going to call it then. Thank you, Brandy, Ed, um, everybody else that was part of putting this thing together. Uh, the Averity DevOps team and the Averity security team, throw your cameras on. Real quick, if you guys have any questions about the DevOps and security job market, you should hit these guys up. They're the best at what they do. 
um, and they can help. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, thank you to our presenters and sponsors for the time, for lunch, for everything, and have an amazing weekend. I'll uh, play a couple of tunes uh, as everybody leaves, but thanks, everybody. Have a great one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.